Jeffrey really needs no introduction, but I just want to share it to you in a personal way. Uh, he, I think, is officially an author and an advisor, but he's actually behind the scenes an all around great human being. He's uh, somebody who actually started as an English lit major, I believe. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and you can tell that in his writing. But he's one of those people who, when he got into, for example, Regis McKenna and worked with so many startups, realized there was a fundamental problem, why startups weren't making it to the promised land. And instead of just watching that, he did something about it. And I have greatest admiration for the fact that he not only did something about it, but he put it in a framework that has made the impact that it has on so many people. So Jeffrey, thank you. It's oh, a great pleasure, pleasure to have you pleasure. here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Um, So I kind of feel like you've already gotten your money's worth. I mean, like, you know, maybe five minutes and we'll be done. Uh, what Michael was doing, and, and what's so important about, about the startup world, is frameworks really, really count. Because at the beginning, you have, that's all you got. There, there's no data, there's no history, there's no, there's no inertial momentum. There's only projections into the future. And using frameworks to create common vocabulary is the way you navigate in a startup. And what I want to do is share with you, and by the way, that's what makes people who love startups, they love that active mind. That active mind begins to be uh, selected against as organizations get larger and larger and larger. And that creates an, a new set of problems which are kind of reflected in the title of this book that, that I've been working on. So for the first 10 years of my career, I worked in, almost entirely with startups, entirely around disruptive innovation. Got to know Clay Christensen, the Innovator's Dilemma. That was what it was about. That was, we call it the 90s, particularly the late 90s, we call the time of the great happiness. Uh, it, was just, it was just great. And then the bubble popped. And when the bubble popped, one of the things that happened was the companies that were left standing were, were, were the, the established large enterprises. Good, you having fun? And, and we began, pardon? And we, began, and we began working with them. And, and, and what I want to share with you is that, is that uh, the books that, that Michael was referring to, Crossing the Chasm Inside the Tornado, that was from, from the point of view of taking the first, your first enterprise kind of all the way through the life cycle. What was the, the later book's about, and what this book is about, is more about a new tech challenge. And, and the old tech challenge was sort of you know, leveraging disruptive innovations breaking into developed markets, navigating the life cycle, crossing the chasm. And a lot of it is emotional. I mean, I thought what was really cool about what Michael did for the last hour is it's your life, right? I mean, it's, it, it comes as much from here as it comes from any place else. Uh, and, and looking at the new challenge, it's a different situation. And it, it's, not, it, it's harder to have that personal energy. If you're in a company of 10,000 people, it's just, it's a very, very different beast, right? It's just, and, 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 but society needs these companies. It's not like we can say, well, you know, we'll just all be startups. It doesn't work, okay? The world wants to some things to scale, and, but if you're going to scale, and if the innovations that you're bringing to market as an entrepreneur are going to have the biggest impact, they must scale, then we have to figure out a new set of issues. And I kind of want to share some of the learnings that have come out of that. So the, the challenge now is how do you leverage established enterprises, and how do they break out of, not break into, we were breaking and entering in the 90s. Now we're trying to actually break out, escape the kind of the inertial pull or the gravitational field of your past, right? And, and solve for this thing that Clay called the innovator's dilemma. He wrote that book in 1997. It's been 15 years. You, you might think we might have actually solved for it, right? Suppose you say, well, no, it's, 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 it's a problem. We'll just live with it. It's like, no, no. And so that's what escape velocity is, is kind of focused on. So just to give you a feeling of this, you know, I've been around, Michael's been around for 20 years, I've been around longer, but I just, this is a kind of a credit list of companies that did not escape. Many of whom were headquartered within probably 50 miles of where we're standing right now. And you look at that list of companies, and the drill here is, these were not bad companies, this, this was the best of the best. This was us, right? So you think, whoa, okay, so maybe, I, maybe it's a little more serious than I thought. However, to be fair, when I would put up that list, a lot of people would say to me, Jeff, wrong century, dude. Come on, come on, come on, 21st century. Come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. So what I want to do with you now, I'm going to share with you just six slides that are comparing 10-year histories in this century of major established companies to the NASDAQ, OK? So the, the, you, you may not be able to read it, but this is Microsoft, Intel, and SAP. The orange line in every case is the NASDAQ. And the other line, the blue line, is the company. Now, you can't, what you really can't see but must see 
but just look at the orange number at the top. That tells you how high this, this axis goes. So this is 100% axis. So what this thing says is over the, over the first last 10 years, the NASDAQ's gone up about 60%. Microsoft's gone up about, looks like about maybe 4 to 8, maybe 9%. Intel's actually gone down a little bit. And SAP has tracked almost exactly to the NASDAQ. Okay? So th those, those are three kind of, okay, pretty close. And the next one is 150 thing. And again, you know, so uh, the NASDAQ's outperformed Cisco, uh, at least uh, recently. IBM has outperformed the NASDAQ recently. Nokia took a, a kind of a header with, 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 the Ender, uh, uh, with the iPhone coming into the world. Uh, Adobe's kind of ha had a good run, but it's kind of come back, we call it regression to the mean or coming back to the norm. You look at the next ones, you say, okay, uh, this is HP, uh, the sort of the, the herd moments where they got, had quite good stock volatility, came right back. Oracle has kind of have a sustained, I think their whole consolidation pitch, I think people are saying, wow, that, that's real new added value. MC was, EMC and, NAS, and NetApp with storage. I think the categories are helping them a lot. This is now 400% variability. Google, obviously, still kind of on their first run, w w way to go. Uh, Autodesk I, I made, I think, a, a significant change in, in their world, getting more into, in, into design and, and the consumer world. eBay, big run, kind of came down. You've got to hand it to John. He's, he's sort of doing some good things there. Citrix, quite, quite an interesting company uh, uh, of recently. Uh, Yahoo, more trials, more tribulations, kind of tough. Uh, and Intuit, interestingly, maybe coming into a new world with, with this new SaaS uh, and, and, and SMB world. And then there are two other stocks. There's Amazon, and there's our friends at Apple. And the, the one at Apple, by the way, goes to 5,000%. Okay, now you look at that and you think, okay, what, what's going on? I mean, what is? And, and I think the conventional wisdom here, and what, all, what, the, what I've heard all my life is, well, the winners outperform the losers, right, or their peers. Well, if, if outperformed means the line went higher, yes. But what is out, what does outperform mean? And I don't believe this. I don't believe. I, I know the companies that quote did not outperform the NASDAQ. I gotta tell you, those are some of the most remarkable performance cultures you will ever see. So these, and there's a couple of exceptions uh, of places, but in general, these companies performed unbelievably well for the last 10 years. I was very close to Cisco for the last 10 years, and, and, and very close to, to, to SAP. And there's, a lot, there's just really, really strong performance capabilities. My belief is that this is not about performance which is a little bit anathema since I'm on the board of directors and shareholders really believe in performance and I'm probably gonna get fired. But the deal here is that if the delta in stock price is not about performance, what is it about? I think it's about power. And what I mean by power is, I mean the, the reason I think changes in power affect changes in stock price is because investors care about your future performance. And they actually value a share of stock as a share of the future earnings of your company, not the past earnings. So what they want to know is, do I think if I buy your stock today, you will outperform your past going forward? When Microsoft is dead flat, that doesn't mean Microsoft isn't performing. It means Microsoft is not outperforming its own past. Okay? It is captured in the gravitational field of its own past. And so I think the P in power is the P and PE ratio. And that when these companies change their stock prices, what happens is, it's not that they, they, they've changed their performance, it's that people see them having much more power. And so for example, if you think about Apple with this 5,000%, why do you believe, why is Apple worth 50 times more now than it was 10 years ago? Well, dude, the iPod, iTunes, iPhone, iPad, where you been, Jeff? Okay, so the point is they had three net new earnings engines added to a fourth one, which has become revitalized by the other three. So they've now got four massive earnings engines where 10 years ago, arguably they had none, or 15 years ago, when Steve came back in 97, arguably they had none, okay? So this issue around power, what, what I think this means to me is what I want to spend time with, uh, with larger companies, and this is a conversation that, that investors always have with small companies and startups. In a startup, there is only power. There is no performance in a startup, right? There's PowerPoints, 
But that's pretty much it, right? Right? So, 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 so if you invest in startups, you're only investing in power. That's the only thing that there is to invest in. Now, you want to translate that power into performance. But what's interesting about large established companies is that thing's gotten reversed. And it's gotten reversed to the point that, that people look at, at, at quarterly returns, which is, which is their version, which is, in fact, the, the classic metrics of performance are built around quarterly financial returns. And they start trying to play, they're trying to guide the future of their company and make management decisions based on quarterly returns, which are performance metrics. And I, I will tell you, if you don't perform, you need to pay attention to them. But, so it's not that they, are, that they are unnecessary, but they are insufficient. And in fact, I think what's happened is that the performance dialogue has become so articulate and the MBA curriculums have become so effective at managing performance, we're wildly out of balance. And what we need to say is, look, it's not that anything about performance is wrong, because it's a yin yang. Right? You create power in order to consume it through performance, in order to create returns to invest in more power. I mean, so, so it's, a, it's a yin and a yang. Right? So, so, but the game there has got to be, we've got to talk more articulately about power. When we come to talk about power in large corporations, and I'm a strategy consultant, so that's kind of what we talk about, the conversation goes from like postgraduate to third grade. Okay? It just sucks. Okay? So the intent of this book and the intent of the work for the last five years is, we need to have a more articulate conversation. So it's back to frameworks. And just like Michael will put up, I don't actually use quite as many uh, 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 acronyms or, or slipperies and flips and cubes and roams and you know, all that kind of cool stuff. I just five. But, but, but the frameworks are, are the key here. Because again, when you're talking about the future, you're talking about stuff. There is no data from the future. Okay? There's kind of a basic rule. So therefore, you have to have frameworks to project into the future. So this framework says, when you're talking about business power, you need to sub-segment that into five kinds of power. And that a lot of the conversations about strategy that are bad happen because the vice president of sales is thinking about, you know, about uh, market power, the engineering guy is thinking about offer power, the you know, company power, the, the CFO is thinking about company power, you know, some vice president of business development is thinking about category, and they're all talking past each other. So here's how it works. The first, and I, by the way, this is the order of importance, I think. The most determinative predictor of your future returns, I believe, is what category you're in. This is sort of like pretty much investor 101. You know, do you want to be invested? You, know, if you, you could be in, in, in printing, right? Or you could be in search. Or you could be in storage. You sort of think, or you could be in desktop PCs. It's like, OK, you, know, you could be the best house in a bad neighborhood. Or you could be kind of a mediocre house in a great neighborhood. And the first predictor of your, of your future for the next few years is going to be what category are you in. So if you're a large company, the challenge is, could we get into a new category? Could we? I mean, obviously, we're, because, because basically, we're getting credit for all the categories we're in already. Could we get into a new category? Because category moves a whole bunch of money into a new place. Could we do that? Could we do that? So that's, that's a pretty important question for companies to ask themselves every year. Many years, the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes, if. And, and of course, part of what we're going to talk about today is co large companies are spectacular at not being able to do this. They're like, just world class at not achieving this objective. Okay? And they spend a fortune against it. So it's a big deal. But what we got to do here is like, damn it, Clay told us that in 1997. We have to solve for this. We can't just, we can't just shake our heads and feel superior. Okay? Company power. Company power is. Are you the go-to company in your category? Do, people, do the partners in your ecosystem bring the business to you first? Then you've got company power. If they don't, you've got a challenge. Now you're swimming uphill all the time. You're trying to earn, earn, earn a thing. And that actually will get you into market power, which is OK. If I can't be the gorilla, if I'm playing a chimp game, I've got to have some place where they like chimps, my chimps. The fact that Apple was around to do the 5,000% was because it had a set of incredibly loyal customers that carried it through a very, very, very tough patch. So market, and, it's, and when you're small, and when you're crossing the chasm, and when you're an entrepreneur, the whole key there is, I need to find some market that will be, be a home where I can grow my company. And that the market itself will protect me. 
My customers will defend me against my competitors because they're that loyal to me. Why? Because I made such a deep commitment to a problem that was specially unique to them, that pain gain thing that Michael was talking about. I made a whole product commitment that nobody else is willing to make. I'm so little, it looked big to me, right? But all the big guys, it just looked like sand in their shoe, so they wouldn't do it. And then there's offer power, which is, you know, the thing itself, the, the price, the performance, the 10x effect that Michael was talking about, that's offer power. And it's great, but you got to understand, offers are ephemeral, right? So offers come and go, but they are the, the only thing on this list that customers can buy, so they're pretty darn important, but you got to realize they're going to move. And then finally, execution power, and you think, well, Jeff, I thought, isn't performance and execution the same thing? For most of the time it is, the place where I don't think it is is in this thing here, which I'm going to talk to you, uh, I want to talk a little bit about execution in terms of anything that is a strategic initiative which requires you to cross a tipping point. It's a subset of execution problems. The claim I'm making is that for most classes of execution problems, large corporations are extremely good at doing them, particularly if they've done them before. But in the class of problems where you have to actually change state and pass a tipping point, large corporations are very bad at it, and that's, that's a huge, huge problem for them. So, th so the whole book, just th this book here, this red book, it's organized around those five, there's a chapter on each of the five powers, and sort of how would you play it, and it's told from the point of view of a larger company, of, of, of a large company who's trying to do this. I, there's two reasons for the entrepreneurs in this room to maybe still say, well, why would I even open this thing? The, the first is, you might get acquired by one of these guys, okay? And then you'll learn about a phrase called an earnout, okay? <laughs> so there it will be a period. And further, when you marry off your only child to someone, you, you actually care about the future of that child. So, you're, you're, so if your company goes and gets acquired by a larger company, you're going to care. You're going to care. And, 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 so hopefully there's some things to, to play there. And also the second thing is, particularly in this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the learning around execution power, and I'm going to close with a little bit of learning around the category power. I'm not going to, do, not going to try to do the ones in the middle, but, but the ones at the beginning, this execution power, there's something in here which I think will be fun for those of you who are not B2B, but who are in fact either B2C or B2B2C. One of the things we learned about crossing the chasm, as Michael uh, championed it, it is a B2B book. It's a B2B book about B2B problems. The last 10 years has been a whole lot of B2C stuff going on. Crossing the chasm is nowhere near as important as inside the tornado, and the way you play the tornado is very different. So I'm going to actually show you a companion model to the crossing the chasm model for B2C stuff, which I think will be kind of interesting. And, but I want to make the point in this context, it's about cross, in both cases, it's about getting past a tipping point. The tipping point that an entrepreneur has to get back for, past is, at the margin, do I have a persistent company? What an accountant will call a going concern. And until you've crossed the chasm, you do not. Meaning, if you withdraw your personal energy, your company will go away. Okay? If you don't get the next round of funding, your company will go away. There's a point at which you cross a tipping point, and if you go away and the funding goes away, the company still persists. It has enough of a flywheel of market reality, customer commitment, partner commitment, working capital, et cetera, et cetera. It is a going concern. That's the fundamental tipping point that entrepreneurs worry about. The, entre the tipping point that established companies have to worry about is, is it possible for us to onboard a net new earnings engine in this enterprise or not? And if you can't, then you cannot, then, then using stock performance is going to be a very, very, very unhappy compensation uh, 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 mechanism for you for decades to come, as it has been at Microsoft, as it has been at Cisco, as it has been at SAP. Because it's, damn it, the stock doesn't move. And what does it take to move the stock? And the claim is it takes a net new earnings engine to move the stock. And that's the idea. And so that is a kind of an entrepreneurial idea as well. OK, so the execution thing. So this is transitioning to scale, growth born from reaching tipping points. Both Think about this both as an entrepreneur who's at Northbridge or MDV or some other incredibly high class VC firm. I don't know if there are any others, but there's like those two. I'm a venture partner at Moore Davidow, uh, where we funded Michael at, at that time. Anyway, um, execution power. So you might be there, or you might be, you, you've just been bought by IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, Google, whomever. So the arc of execution, where in the execution life cycle are you? So when you look at execution, you have this thing, okay, we're inventing it, 
And at some point, we are going to deploy this thing at scale. And eventually, if it's out in the world long enough, we're actually going to worry about how to optimize this thing. And the scalability is, is, is the key thing that I'm going to be focused on. There's a subsequent transition around profitability. The consulting ideas about deploying and optimizing are about 30 to 45 years old. They're extremely good. They're based on using data dramatically. They're not based on very much on frameworks. But the stuff on scaling has to be still based on frameworks because, again, you're inventing the future. So in this model, oh, that didn't work very well. OK, so in this model, uh, there's a tipping point. And the claim about this tipping point is prior to the tipping point, every day it is harder. You wake up, and it's actually a harder day than the previous day. It's a little bit like bicycling. You know, if you start bicycling and you go over a hill, you're kind of going initially on the flat. Your bike, you're starting up. You know, you got your bike going. Okay, it's going. It's going pretty good, pretty good. And then you start up the hill, and you're still pedaling pretty good. And then there's just a, uh, okay. There's some point in here, and in my case, sooner than your case. But 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 you're at this point, and until you're going to get to the top of the hill, every next ten yards, you're actually performing worse than you did the prior ten yards. So, so if, if, if I'm using performance metrics, your performance is degrading systematically as you go forward. And sooner or later, if I'm, using, if I'm looking at you through a performance lens, I'm going to say, Jeff, you're not much of a bicyclist, are you? Huh, dude, dude. You should like maybe drive or walk. You know, get off the bike. We're not going to fund the bike any longer. Okay? <laughs> That's what happens to strategic initiatives. Okay. In other words, they get to that point, and, 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 and the, so the key concept here, and it's a real challenge, is to say to people, until you've reached the tipping point, no performance metric matters unless it's related to getting to the tipping point, past the tipping point. So return on invested capital, return on equity, uh, you know, operating ratios, cost to, cost to traffic, revenue, every conceivable operating metric that the corporation runs all of its annual planning, all of its investor relations around. Not, it's not that they're irrelevant, they're toxic. They're toxic. Okay? That's why there is a venture industry, because venture, you know, venture, and what venture does, though, to be fair to it, it just takes it completely out of that environment and says, well, we're just going to play in an environment. We've raised capital with the understanding that operating metrics aren't important until after the tipping point. That's the fundamental contract with the limited partner. That is not a contract you have in a large corporation. It is not the contract with a public shareholder. So understand, if you're running a large corporation, you've got a real challenge. Okay? And by the way, we can say, well, that's their problem, not our problem, except we live in a society that needs jobs. And large corporations have a lot of jobs. Okay? OK, so why tipping points? This, uh, 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 Michael was talking about this, but this notion that adoption is social. People do what they see other people doing. That's what creates a tipping point. So I'm, junior high dance problem, right? Boys on one side of gym, girls on the other side of a gym, right? Adoption is social, right? I'm not going, you go out there. I'm not going out there, right? And, and then at some other point, it's like everybody's out there, and oh my god, i got to get out there, right? Uh, it was very harder, by the way, in my day, because in my day, a boy and a girl had to dance in pairs. Right? It's a little easier now. You just, you just get out there, go out, you dance like around like this. You, you'll, you'll look good. You'll look good. Okay. <laughs> it leads to two mirror image phenomena, which is the chasm, which is I'm not going out there, and the tornado, which is oh, I'm not staying. I'm not staying back. Right? But both cases, it's peer pressure. Right? It's peer pressure in both ways. Uh, Pre-tipping point, no progress is sustainable, <coughs> and post-tipping point, there's no going back. I mean, the, the tipping point is fundamental to, to this game. And any strategic initiative has a tipping point idea behind it. So, so managing to the tipping point became a really powerful notion. And I kept on challenging managers. I'd say, you know, do you guys manage to the tipping point? Do you even have any metrics about where you think the tipping point is? Do you have any, do you have any how do you know? How will you know? Finally, one CEO said, Jeffrey, stop. Tipping points are really easy to see in retrospect. Right? How do you see them looking the other way? It's like, good question. Let me get back to you on that. Right? It's like, OK, how do you? And, and the issue is, you, you, so you have to start using frameworks, and you have to start making guesses. And you may just arbitrarily invent it. And we say, you know what? We believe that 250 customers will have passed the tipping point. You don't know that. 
you, 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 your gut tells you something. You say, and in addition to that, if eighty, if eighteen percent of those customers cross-reference to another customer, or you know, if I see you know a, 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 a return to my site of you know more than thirty percent of the customers come back more than once a week, and they'd stay there more than six minutes. Who the hell knows what it is, right? But you have to have something to say, let us drive to that place and see if we got to the tipping point. And, 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 and then kind of plan, kind of plan it forward. So the tipping point in the B2B world, this is the one that, that Michael and I spent all the time with in the 90s. It is a great B2B model. It is not a B2C model. But it just said, look, in this social adoption of things, there's the people that go really early, the innovators, then the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, the laggards. The key thing that the crossing the chasm was about was, guys, the first two groups secede from the bell curve and create something we call the early market. And that also, however, the pragmatists will not. The pragmatists are hanging back now. And that created the chasm. And the whole idea behind this was, if you could find a subset of pragmatists, a very focused segment. Remember when Mark, Michael took you through all those circles and we got down to field service personnel, the medical equipment, in critical care conditions, right, right there? Find, we called them pragmatists in pain, because pragmatists in pain are more likely to convert before pragmatists in general. But eventually, you do get the killer app for pragmatists in general. That's what creates the tornado. That is no longer a niche market phenomenon. That's now a mass market phenomenon, or at least a horizontal phenomenon. And, and then you get to Main Street. And the key lesson of this model was, when you start an innovation, you have to do it twice. The first one flames out. So when you think you've lit the fire, you've lit the pre-fire. It's an important fire to light. That's what Steve Blank was trying to tell us with Four Steps to Epiphany. It's what Eric Reese is trying to tell us with Pivot. They're actually doing pre-chasm entrepreneurship. There's a lot of work you got to do to get to the chasm. Okay? But the point of this model is you got to light the fire twice. And the way you light the fire the second time is totally different from the way you lit it the first time. So first time, you, you, you light the fire on optimism. Second time, you light the fire on pessimism. Right? The marketing of the first one is look at all the wonderful things this technology can do. The marketing of the second one is look how deep the soup is that you're standing in. Okay? And I can get you out. But totally different, totally different game. That's why the whole product became so important to the second one. I can get you out of that quicksand. I have rope, I have, I have a place to tie it, I have a winch, I got the whole thing, right? That, that, that was the promise. Okay, in that world, we developed a whole set of metrics. This is the set of metrics, it's been, it's been around for a long time. But at every stage, it would say to you, are we here, and if we've done these things, are we gonna move on to the next, to the next move? And, the B2B world has had a chance to play with that for a while. The problem with these metrics is, and it started happening about four or five years ago, I'd start getting these kind of nice, sort of deflecting comments from students saying, you know that Crossing the Chasm, that, that was a great book. Did you say was? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, really, the, really, Jeff, it was, it was a great book, right? Oh, okay, oh thank you. Okay. <laughs> so so I, they said, well, well, Jeff, I mean, Google, Facebook, YouTube, I mean, Instagram. Where, where was the chasm in Instagram? He got a billion dollars. Where, where, what? Effing chasm is what, usually, what they're usually saying. At this point. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? You are so clueless. It's embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> And you know, it's, that's not bad. If you hang out in a venture firm, you at least try to look clue. I mean, you have a clue. You don't have to actually have a clue, but you have to look like you have a clue. And you can't stand on stage being clueless because it makes your partners embarrassed. So we said, okay, we got to come up with a different way to think about this. And so spent some time with people who were doing these kinds of projects. So what, what do you do? How, how do you? how do you make these things work? And we came up with this concept that the entrepreneur is like a, like a starter motor. And you're, you're trying to start one of these things. It, 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 we're trying to start a tornado. What we realized is that it wasn't a chasm problem, it was a tornado problem. And you say, well, how do you start a tornado? Kind of, in the, in, particularly on the web. And so they said, well, you got to acquire traffic somehow. So part of the thing is I'm going to run some experiments to figure out how can I acquire traffic, hopefully at low cost, hope, maybe at no cost. Then I have to come up with some way to engage. I've got to engage this traffic in a way that, that, that causes them to participate and value me. Then at some point, I've got to figure out how to monetize this. Now, in a lot of these models, monetization comes very late in the game, but you have to figure out eventually. And then I need to, have to figure out how to enlist people to help 
me acquire the next traffic. So, so whether that's an upsell of myself personally or whether I'm referring a friend, you cannot, you, you have to have, the community has to help you enlist uh, to, to get the next, the next round of acquisitions. So think about Zynga and you know, how getting your friends to play Farmville with you, that kind of an enlistment idea, right? So engagement is you participating, but enlistment is when you actually get other people to come pl uh, play in the community as well. So you think about, a, uh, about how this works, um, the, 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 uh, the guy in the middle, the starter motor, what he's doing is he's running these experiments. So he or she, the acquisition, engagement, you know, monetization, enlistment, we're just, we're just we're kind of, how would this work? You know? And then if the enlistment could get some more acquisition, okay, well, could that get some more engagement? Well, could that get some, uh, you know, uh, you know can we, and could we get a tornado? <laughs> and the answer is, Maybe, <laughs> maybe, not, not so often, but this apparently is state of the art. <laughs> you know, and by the way, prior to most of this, you were in the dorm room and your parents were paying for the dorm room anyway, so what, what the hell, right? I mean, you know, it didn't cost that much. Um, but, but that's kind of what was going on. So when we looked at this, we started to de decode it and say, okay, so what's going on and why does it matter? And we realized that two of these gears were performance gears. Now they was, those were the gears that people were measuring on comm score, they were measuring them on you know, any way they could. And the monetization gear, and these are the two gears that anybody who had investment in the company, you know, it was, a, well, how much traffic are you getting? Well, how much are they spending on you? you give, me all, give me all your operating metrics. We called them the performance gears, and then we looked at the other two gears, and we said, you know what? They're the power gears. They're the power gears. And they're actually the gears that are gonna determine the future performance. So how engaged are people in this operation? the consumer, and how enlisted are they? And enlisted, by the way, is a really interesting, very simple enlistment metric called the net promoter score. You know that, that thing, NPS? Where, where they, the, question, the fundamental question they ask you is, how likely one to 10 are you to refer this offer to a friend? And it turns out if, if a person says nine or 10, that means you have a viral, a positive virality. If they say seven to eight, you have a neutral virality. And if you have less than six or less, you actually have churn. You have a negative, a, a negative virality, okay? So we're looking at that and say, okay, so gosh, so, so, so that led to a pretty interesting idea. So here are the four things you wanna measure, and you do want them. And by the way, the person who said measure and then measure underneath and then measure underneath, these are the four places you wanna start and then you wanna go into, how, what is your rate of gaining new traffic or new users if it's a retail game, new customers, whatever it is. What is their kind of engagement, whether that's length, depth, frequency of user engagement, and obviously in different situations, those are different things. How well is this thing monetizing? One of the knocks on Zynga is like 3% of their traffic monetize, 97% of their traffic does not monetize. So you say, well that seems a little bit concerning. Uh, and, then, and then enlistment, who helps? And by the way, if you look at different properties right now, you say, well let's look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn, acquisition, off the top, off the charts. Uh, enlistment, you bet, people tell you to get on LinkedIn, okay? Monetization, the recruiters alone can monetize the hell out of that thing, right? Engagement, that's their concern. We don't spend enough time on LinkedIn, right? That's, their so that's where they're worried. Facebook, you've heard of Facebook perhaps. Okay, so Facebook, what's their issue? Well, I bet a billion, 100 billion, what could, could they have an issue? Yes, they can have an issue. Acquisition, 900 million. I think they got that one pretty good. Okay, no, 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 I don't think it's a big problem. Engagement, you gotta be kidding me. People live on Facebook, okay? Not a problem. Enlistment, if you're, not in, if you're in the family and you're not on Facebook, your relatives will tell you, get on Facebook, okay? Monetization, interesting. Desktop, not so bad. Mobile, a disaster waiting to happen. The mobile monetization mechanism for Facebook does not exist in any reason, in anything that would correspond to the valuation that's gonna be hit this week. It just doesn't. Now, could it? Yes. Does everybody want it to? Yes. Is it just Facebook's problem? Hell no. Everybody has this issue of how are we gonna, because 50% of Facebook's traffic is on mobile devices. 50%. So the point about this thing is, in different situations, you, you will have different metrics matter. You should use this as an analytical filter to look at your B2C or even your B2B2C, 
where you're the first bee helping the second bee, look over that second bee's shoulders and look at their C situation and figure out which of these four metrics is the one that they've got to fix, hopefully with your help. And so we have this concept called the slowest gear theory. Uh, just says, look, the thesis is prior to the tornado, at any given point in time, one of these gears is probably going to be slower than the other three. And so the actions that we are suggesting here are identify the slowest gear, focus everyone on speeding that one up, but don't take your eye completely off the other three gears. I mean, you can't just like be a serial, <laughs> this is where serial entrepreneur doesn't work. You have to keep all four gears spinning, right? Repeat every quarter until the tornado happens or you run out of gas, okay? And that's sort of, that's sort of the, the new model. So I'm gonna stop there for a second and just, I'd love to get your, so maybe your crap detector went off or, 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 or you know, how would you react to this model, or what, what do you see in this model? A comment or a question? I'd love to just get a little bit of feedback. Yeah. Are you saying that this, like your other framework, is just a B2B model, or it should? It doesn't strike me that there's an obvious distinction between B2B and B2C in this case. Um, I think it. I think it is. The, the distinction is, this is, I think, a B2C model in the sense that it, it involves large number of people largely acting on their own. Whereas B2B models, you remember when Michael showed that huge set of constituencies that you all have to get aligned in order to get a sale? So that, that's the kind of inertial resistance where, where the B2B model works better. But in this one, I mean, and, and in a sense, you know, a tornado is a tornado in, in both ones. But I think this one's more about you don't have to get that kind of institutional buy-in, but you've got to get critical mass, whatever that, whatever that means. So that's the only reason I would call it. It might be B to E if it, in an employee. It could, it could be that, okay? Uh, if you have an order of magnitude improvement on the present state of the art, as Mike was speaking earlier, is it possible to jump over the early adopters and go directly to a mainline, you're solving their core problem, and get those straight to the bottom? Yeah, but it's interesting, you know, going, uh, the, 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 the uh, Yes, the question is how discontinuous is your innovation? If you just make gasoline that, that is twice as effective and sells for half as much money, there's no adoption life cycle. Just put up the station, dude. Uh, so, so the issue then is, is how disruptive is it or who has to change their way, form of behavior? If the consumer doesn't have to change, that gives you enormous leverage against whoever does have to change to make them change. Look at what Apple did when they essentially gave iTunes to their folks. They could then make the entire music industry, which did not want to change, change because they had this incredible power. And they got that power because from the user's point of view, there was no technology adoption. Just go to iTunes and get your songs. I mean, you paid for them. That was strange, by the way, because remember, we had NetApp. I'm not, uh, we had Napster. Yeah, Napster. So yeah, okay, it was 99 cents. But, but it was, it was, they, there was a de minimis enough change. So I think, I think in the B2C model, it's not about chasms and bowling pins. I really do think it's about going straight to the tornado, just straight to the tornado. Um, whereas I think in B2B, it is about chasms and bowling pins, because there's enough inertial resistance to anything new that you've got to overcome it. I think B2B is more predictable. I think B2Cs, when they win, are more lucrative. But B2Cs are still, to me, somewhat mystical. I think the, the, the gears, I think, help. But I think, you know, you're still trying to figure out what does it take to get a date, you know? I spent my entire adolescence trying to answer that question. <laughs> and I broke it down into frameworks, and it didn't help. OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This model, what you would say about sustainability, you know, a lot of the opportunities you're talking about are ones which, you know, one person does, another person do it very quickly, and you've got to do it right and build a market or build a critical. I think, I think there's something inherently unsustainable. I think this is a fad business to a large degree. I, look at the movie business, look at the music business, look at, look at all the great consumer businesses. Uh, this, uh, th there are some that have sustained, McDonald's is a sustained consumer franchise. Um, it, but, but boy, there are an awful lot that, 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 that you know, don't, don't, don't get there. So it's, it's, a, it's a different game now. And you try to institutionalize it, like they made movie studios, we'll have DreamWorks, you know, DreamWorks will always create hit movies. N not so much, you know, and, and so uh, John Carter, yeah, okay. Uh, that wasn't DreamWorks, that was Disney, I know. Uh, but, uh, but that would be the other half of that. There's a question in the back, or a comment in the back. That was basically my question, but, you know, kind of building on that. So it's, it seems to me, you know, kind of thinking, I'm not, 
I don't know a lot about B2C, but you know, just basically between B2B and B2C, for B2C, it just seems like a lot of people who are just kind of spending disposable income, and it's kind of, think of it like, kind of like you're selling stupid people, you know, like, like Zynga is basically selling people like a big time sink and stuff yeah. like that. Is that kind of, you know, good thing? Is that kind of yeah. where our entrepreneurial yeah. energy yeah. should be yeah. I, I think if you were talking about, uh, let me make it, put more honor into this system. All of human culture is going online and is being consumed through digital devices. And I mean all of human culture. I mean education, I mean healthcare, I mean war, and I mean love. And, and, and I mean literature, and I mean film, and I mean music, and I mean art, and I mean sports, and I mean news, and I mean being a citizen, and I mean being a criminal, right? It's all online. And, and it's becoming more online. So I think, I think there's a, I think Zynga is a good example of wasting time online. And I think all of us waste a certain amount of time online because we're usually standing in line at Starbucks and so therefore wasting time, why not waste, you know, in a more interesting way. <laughs> but, 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 and I think, and by, by the way, and, and the economics isn't that I'm buying stupid stuff as often as I'm being advertised to. One of the scary things about this is the way that model was monetized was is media advertising, right? Brand advertising, media advertising. And the problem is we haven't cracked the code on these small, I think on an iPad you're fine, but on anything smaller, that's the spooky thing. Yeah. Um, I think what you say repeat every quarter is way too small. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm old, so just bear with me. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I, I think it probably is too slow. I, I think in a large company it's probably not too slow uh, because that actually is, light speed in, in some large companies, but you're right. So what do you think is a better, is a more likely cadence? Weekly? Weekly? Repeat every week? Well, if you're measuring yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I, I'm with you. I, I think I, I, actually I buy that, I think. I would do it weekly until, if, if, if maybe after a while you'd say, that maybe even weekly is too little, but I, I don't think it is. But maybe you'd go, I think that's a, that's a good fix, yes. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. And I want to ask you, according to your framework, for example, in the case of LinkedIn, when they went into Japan, they tried the same formula, and they have half a million users in a country with a hundred and thirty million <coughs> population. So, do you apply this framework in each single market again? Because you have every to. single new market is a new revenue stream by the end of the day. So, I, and I think it may be a different gear. It may be a different gear. So, for example, in Japan, I'll bet you that the enlistment gear runs at the speed of a glacier. But just think about Japanese culture. You're gonna reach out to another business person in Japan and tell them to join LinkedIn? Not in any of the meetings I was in in Japan. So, so I do, th so, I, so, I think, I think there are, so I think you're right, you have to solve for different dynamics in different places. Maybe if they could get the engagement gear to go faster in Japan, that would give them some help. But if they try to work directly on the enlistment gear directly, well, maybe they, I'm, I don't know, but you're right. But, but so they have, an, they have an engagement gear problem in the U.S. They, I would argue they have an enlistment one in Japan. Yeah. Is, is there a bit of a timing issue in that it seems like you've got to get enough of the funnel cloud going before you focus on the other ones. If you're Facebook and you focus on the monetization really hard, really early. Doesn't work. You know, yeah. I would argue for media models in general, and I would say that Facebook is a media property, um, you, don't, you actually monetize, monetize very, very late. We used to have a thing in the, in, in the 90s which was called URL stood for ubiquity now, revenue later. And, and, and that, that is the media model, I think. So you would, that would be an example where you just set monetization aside. Google didn't, mon remember, Google had gone public really before it really had a, a clear monetization model. And, 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 and so, yeah, yeah. How do you see this model playing into this trend towards the sort of consumerization of enterprise? You, know, you look at Apple, Google as kind of examples of that where consumers let first enterprise adopt later, right. and Facebook's kind of scary in that. Who knows if right. it's an enterprise No, this is, a, this is important. It relates a little bit to the question that came out of here. So I, I'm sort of dining out on a speech I'm giving these days about enterprise IT, which says, from systems of record to systems of engagement. So I, I think of these consumerization thing as systems of engagement. And I think of the old database Oracle stuff as systems of record. So two things have to happen. This model would work for the employee side of adoption. So, and, and in general, what, what people are doing, because sometimes people say, well, it's just like Facebook. 
And it's this dweeby thing that HR came out with that just sucks, right? So it's not just like, okay, so, so there's still a kind of a engagement problem you gotta get there. Yeah, come to our corporate website and learn about all the exciting things HR wants you to learn about. Even in Starbucks, I wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> so, so, okay, so, but then the other half of it, if it's a, like, so now what is happening in IT is bring your own device. So people are saying, you know, bring anything, bring Mac, PC, Android, iPod, whatever the hell, iPad, whatever it is. So that, okay, so now I've got the B, the B, the E is already in. There, but now the, the CIO is going, hang on, I have a boatload of very, very, very tough problems to solve. And I, and I have a re restricted talent base. And by the way, it's not fit for this purpose. So that's where the chasm problem is happening. So I would argue Jive, Chatter, uh, Yammer, uh, all that stuff, I don't think it's crossed the chasm. I, I, I think it's still on the early side of the chasm because the problem is the IT guys are still trying to balkanize it, bucket it, you know, keep it at some distance because there's some very, very real liability security issues. And, and, and I know sometimes they use security as a head fake, but in this case, it, it probably is real. Yeah. I hate the idea of poking a hole in the framework because I actually no, bring it. No, it helps to put well, a hole. The yeah. examples you bring, it seems like they didn't focus on increasing the speed of their slowest gears. They instead looked at what gears were spinning the fastest and it helped make those spin even faster and capitalize on those. And eventually that compensated for whatever was. Wow. So that, that, should be, that should be an alternative game plan. Let's call that game plan B, which is screw the brakes, let's just hit the accelerator, right? Or, you know, no, but, 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 but kind of, you know, you know kind of. So, so this guy, he's got, he thinks we have to run on four wheels. No, we can, we're a unicycle. <laughs> okay. You know, I feel, it feels like there's some truth in that. It really does. So, so no, man, just spin the hell out of one of those gears and see if they can't like drag the other ones around with them. I think, that's a, I think it's a, a totally viable hypothesis, and I think it'll be called like, Hypo action hypothesis number two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just yeah. a couple quick thoughts. One is, uh, I, I, I think that putting monetization before enlistment, I just feel like enlistment comes way, way earlier, like right after acquisition, in the way these things tend to work when they're successful. I think the other thing is that um, it, it, engagement is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a tricky thing because like you used the Zynga example, and I think people are very engaged in those games. Yes. They're, they're in them all the time. And then you take Google, which is obviously a much more effective monetization effort, and I think you know, the Google folks will say, our goal is to get people <coughs> off the page, off the SERP page, as fast as possible. Right. Um, and so it's almost, I mean, I think there's another concept that is maybe yes. fits under engagement, which yeah. has to do with delight, yeah. which has to do with like how it triggers pleasure. Yeah. And Google triggers pleasure. By getting you out of here, get, get in, get out, and get, get on with your life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, I think that's true. The other one, by the way, the reason monetization is where it is, not, well, part of it was because I couldn't redraw the diagram, let's be clear. Uh, but <laughs> but, but uh, power, no expense was spared on this presentation because none was incurred. I, I just, I, uh, but, but, um, but in a retail model, in a retail model, it's where it belongs. And actually, the last time I gave this talk was to an online e-commerce situation where you had to monetize early on and so you had to put it in there, but I, I agree with Adam. I think in the media game, it's totally correct. The, the, the monetization gear comes forth and often comes very late in the game and lightly. And you kind of like, it's almost like a clutch. It's almost like a not, you know, in it, don't, don't slow it down too much, you know, kind of. I think just, sorry, just yeah. one more thing. You're yeah. comparing the B2B and the B2C models. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of startups have gotten obsessed with what I think is a B2B model, which is this idea of minimally viable product. Yeah. I don't think it works in B2C. I mean, I think viable sounds like you're still in the ICU, and nobody wants to hang out with people in the ICU. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. No, this is like, this is like Valentine's Day, minimally viable bouquet. Probably not, probably not the romance winner, you know? If she sees the cellophane around it, you know, and like Kroger's in the, I gave her flowers on Valentine's Day, for God's sake, what does she expect, right? Eh, well, more than that, more than that. Okay, yeah, so, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Delighting, Deli so that's a delighter issue, yeah, you bet. So, yeah, why well, I want to push back a little bit on the idea of the time frame, how long is it you vary again, and I think a lot of the rhetoric now in the, like, lean startup methodology is that it's, when you're testing hypotheses, you're, you're really, your role is as, as a scientist. So it's really a question of statistical significance. Yes. Where if you have a large user funnel and you can get a lot of data and feedback, there's no reason why you can't iterate 
you know, five times in the same day if you actually have a large pipe going in to test right. certain hypotheses, and you can do these things in parallel. So there's no reason why you can't run five right. tests at the same time. Right. And pick the best one. I, I think, I, so fair enough. So if you, if you could do design of experiments and actually are smart enough to, to be able to do multivariant kind of regression analysis, yes. And I think the point that's coming out here that we all should absorb is, Jeff, it isn't a specific cycle of time. It's how fast can we close the loop in, in, in a reasonably and expect to learn something and, the, and, the, and then move on. And also, obviously, on the web, speed, the faster, this is such a fast medium that the faster you can do it, the better you can do it without burning out your company. Okay, yeah. I think one thing that might be subtly missing, but I'm not sure it's a missing gear to sort of yeah. get behind the scenes is the uh, importance of adoption, support, innovation from other business partners. I think part of the reason why monetization comes so late in media is that the advertisers, the advertising agencies, don't have a clue at first how to use it. Right. So it takes a while for them to figure out what the ad unit is, right. what the interaction right. is. And with, with iTunes, you, know, you could have iTunes, but until you, until you bring the music industry right. up. Right, you had to bring the backlist. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I think that's fair. I think, I think you should be always looking for kind of like the inherent inertial resistance to the new phenomenon. Uh, and and, and in, in some cases, like with, with, with Zynga, I think they actually were able to spin up pretty quickly because they used virtual goods as their own thing. But that's, and their partner was Facebook. And their partner was Facebook, fair enough. And, 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 they, and they got that kind of going there. Okay. Okay, well, that was, that, so that was some of the stuff I wanted to share. I just want to close with one thing. I'm going to take it another place, and then if we have some time for talking about it, or maybe we'll talk about it over lunch. But, but this is the one that has to do, this is when I'm spending time in boardrooms with CEOs and executive teams, making myself pretty thoroughly unpopular. And, and here's kind of, so it says, look, guys, we, this is this category power idea. You know, we've talked a lot about the venture world where they are. This is the, the great place for a, a, a big company is to be in the B section of this thing. No adoption problems, you just scale it. The C is where you have to actually worry about optimizing margins. You know, the D is where you start worrying about, oh my God, if I stay too long in this category, I will have a Kodak moment. And the, that's, the, that's the Kodak moment at the end, okay? Kind of thing. Well, but, you know, that w I would argue that Kodak was one of the five best brands in the world for most of my life, at least in the top 10. So, so it, I mean, this is brutal, right? Uh, so you acquire power, you utilize power, you invest power. And then, and then the idea, what, 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 what you're trying to do when you reinvent yourself, you're not trying to recross the chasm, because frankly, that, that's too small. You've got to have something that's big enough to scale pretty quickly. What you'd really like to do is kind of get into a new category, kind of on the, on the right side of the chasm, ideally, like right about there, and, to, and then kind of scale that up, going, going up. That's what you'd like to have happen. Because what you're looking for is you want growth, but you, and, and that's what, that, and by the way, that means you need to acquire or develop power. But the issue is at some size, if you're a $10 billion company or a 20 or 30 or $40 billion company, just fig, it's the law of large numbers. You can't really change your stock price until you have a new earnings engine that's earning several billion dollars. So you're a hundred million dollars, like you're a rounding error, right? So it's a real problem if you think about that. And, and that's where the performance metrics, so you have this real challenge, you have to have power and performance in order to have this thing move the needle in a large company. And, and so when you look at these A, B, C, Ds, they kind of go like that. Basically, you know, the, the, the early thing, it's high growth, but it's not material revenues. You're gonna try to get into the B section of that curve, which is gonna give you both high growth and material revenues. Eventually, you'll get into the C section. It'll become yet another earnings engine. It will be the 8086 architecture at Intel, or it will be Windows, or it will be Office at Microsoft, or it will be you know, the ERP suite at SAP, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, and then the final one would be, would be D, which is it, it, it's, it's heading toward E. Right? Okay. So here's what you see in, in the world of uh, large companies. This is a typical portfolio pattern in virtually all companies that have those stock prices which are close to the NASDAQ. They have big franchises, but they're not growing very fast. If you spend time in them, it's not visible in, outside the company, but inside the company, they have way cool, neat stuff, but it's not material in terms of the size of the revenue, and they've got some aging stuff, right? And the first question the board always asks is, why don't we have more business in Quadrant 2? You know, did, did, you have, did, did you guys see Quadrant 2? How about Quadrant 2, right? And, and so you look at this problem, and the, this, is, this is how it happens. So it turns out the key to understanding a large corporation is to understand that there are three different investment horizons that 
interact with each other in a large corporation that cause the dynamic called the innovator's dilemma. The first horizon is, if I spend money on this, I will make it back this year. I'll hire more salespeople, my revenue will go up. Okay? It's a horizon one, it's all about operating expenses, it's all about getting things done. You know what? Large corporations are world class at this stuff. Just really, really, really good. What we always say about large corporations is, you know what? They can't innovate for, sh for some soup. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But anyway, you know what? Not true. Totally untrue. The labs in large corporations have way cool stuff. Venture would kill to get that stuff and often does. Okay? Um, so, so, I mean, really, I mean, think about Xerox Park. It just, like, Silicon Valley dined off of Xerox Park for like two decades. It was really, really cool stuff. The problem was when they try to bring it from Horizon 3, which is, I'm going to get a return on this investment, but not anytime soon. And by the way, it comes out of a CapEx budget more than the OpEx budget. It's kind of like the corporate tax that we spend on the future. But when you try to get through Horizon 2, which is an interesting horizon, Horizon 2 says, we're going to spend money out of our working capital budget this year, and we're actually not going to get anything for it this year. We'll get something for it next year, and something really pretty exciting for it the following year. And thank you for playing. Okay, so what, what's going on here? Because th th this, is, this is absolutely fatal to innovation. So what's going on here, Horizon 3 coming in, Horizon 2 is the one where I'm trying to get from Horizon 3 to Horizon 1. Horizon 1 is the, the, all the, where all the material revenues are created. Horizon 0, if you want to worry about it, is kind of where we're getting in danger of running off the thing. So performance management is all about Horizon 1. We're really good at Horizon 1, not a problem. Horizon 1 managers, how do you do that? How do you make your numbers quarter after quarter after quarter? You cheat, you lie, and you steal. And then you try not to lie too much. But you steal all the time. You hoard resources because you can't get it done any other way. There's too much variability in the world. So all of a sudden, H2 comes, and the thing that makes H2 different from H3 is H2 wants the same resources that H1 uses. And in particular, they want the same sales resources, the same go-to-market resources, marketing resources, professional service. It's all the customer-facing stuff that really is, is in jeopardy here. And, 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 and so it, uh, the, the H1 managers go, ah! And, you know, and they, by the way, they also cling, they cling to the other business. They need more money. But, and Horizon 3 is not affected. So the Horizon 2 challenge is, it, it's just, it works like this. H1, during the annual planning process, gets first dibs at all the resources. By the time H2 gets to the table, there are no A players left. Right? There are probably a few lingering Bs. Right? I mean, just because they grabbed them all. Right? They, and, so, and so H3, by the way, gets stars, but they're not stars that H1 wants. I mean, they're weird people. Right? But, but, but they're wonderfully weird. But they're not useful in H1. They're useful as corporate entertainment. Right? Bring your customer to corporate. Show them, like, Larry, with whatever that weird thing Larry's doing. <laughs> And then sell them some more storage servers, right? You know, come on. Okay? So it's, it's a great relationship, right? But H2 is like no dice. H2 is now an entrepreneurial business unit trying to get a piece of my sales force, a piece of my marketing budget. A, it, it's like, and a, no, no. So, so, and, and the problem is, in that model, the H1 guy says, well, I can support as many H2 initiatives as you want. I don't, if you don't want me to make my number. I mean, it's blackmail. It's pure and utter blackmail. But it's a blackmail that works both ways because the CEO has been pounding them to make his or her number forever. So this is not an R&D problem. This is a go-to-market problem. Okay? That, that's where this thing actually gets killed. And here was the big aha. Innovation is not a funnel. It is an hourglass. That's, 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 the, tweet, that's the tweetable remark for those of you on hashtag you know, startups. Or whatever. <laughs> because... because be, we can have as many things as you want in H3 and as many things as you want in H1. H2 is the problem statement. So if you look at that and you say, what's, what's the H2 challenge and then how do you solve for it? And then I'm, uh, that, that's all I want to share with you. The challenge is pretty clear. If you are going to actually move those stock chart things, you have to create a net new earnings engine that I would argue is somewhere between 5 and 10% of total revenues and looks like it's probably going to go to 15 to 20 in the not too distant future. Somewhere around here, the investors go, whoo, dude. So it's interesting. So video at Cisco hasn't quite gotten there yet. You think it might, might, but it hasn't. SharePoint or Xbox at Microsoft, interesting. Not, 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 not quite yet, 
right? Don't, don't feel you're quite, quite there yet, because I think still 85% of Microsoft's net revenue pretty much is Office Windows of some variation thereof. So you gotta get to a certain point, but clearly, clearly iPod did it, clearly iPhone did it, clearly iPad did it, clearly um, Amazon Web Services has done it to Amazon, so we, that's where they got that, that one from, okay? So somewhere in there, okay? Right now, when you start, you're, if you're below somewhere between 1%, you don't even show. You can hide. You can effectively be like a Horizon 3 play. So if you think, if you just sort of set that as an order of magnitude move, the journey is I have to grow one order of magnitude, and the question is how much time can a large public corporation give you to do that? I will submit to you that they, they, they'll certainly give you one year, and there's no chance that you can do it in one year. They will reluctantly give you two years, and there's probably no chance you can do it in two years, but if you make enough progress, they will grudgingly give you the third year, and if you don't get it done in the third year, I don't think you get the fourth year. Okay. That would be my sort of order of magnitude play here. So that, this means when you take on this assignment, you're behind. Probably somewhere between three and six quarters. Right? I mean, it's, it's brutal, it's a brutal assignment. Okay? So Horizon 2 is not a stable state. You either get through it or you die. And by the way, that, that's the venture-like thing here. Because venture capitals are not stable institutions. You can't just say, I'll just raise more capital. You know? At some point, those nice, friendly VCs, not so friendly, right? You know, oh, hi, hi, no, 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 we're not, no, we're not funding, no, no. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's not a stable state. So, so, so this is the issue inside the corporation. So then the question was, and this is the last slide, this is kind of the, the, the money slide. So, okay, dude, what would you do differently? How would you play this game to actually win? And, 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 you know, don't fool around because, you know, this is going to be painful. We don't want to do it twice. So the first thing is how many Horizon 2 initiatives can you do at the same time? I, this is the first place where I make myself radically unpopular. The answer is one. Only one. And I don't care if you're a $100 billion corporation. The answer is one. That sounds so wrong to so, for so many reasons to so many people that it almost ends the conversation there, except they're too polite to kick me out of the room because it's like, that can't be right. That cannot be right. Look at the odds of these things. But my point is, this is a one-lane highway. If you put two cars onto a one-lane highway, you've just guaranteed that neither of them will get through. So the only way to get this thing through is one at a time. Now you can have as many Horizon 3 initiatives waiting to get on the highway, and you can have as many Horizon 1 businesses as you want to run. Large corporations can run many things in Horizon 1, and they can do many experiments in Horizon 3, one to get through the pipe. Second one, when do you plan and budget for this initiative? Not with all the other children, right? You have to, if you're going to actually get the right resourcing for this, both in the field and in the factory, you have to plan, do your annual planning for your Horizon 2 one quarter before you do your annual planning for everything else. Once the annual planning, the, the real annual planning starts, the knives are out, it's a zero-sum game, there is zero chance the Horizon 2 guy is going to survive. Zero. Okay? That's number two. Three. What kind of a structure do you need? You need a venture-like structure. The reason why venture-backed companies can kick the tail out of large corporations routinely is because they have this fast cycle time latency that we've been talking about. And, and, and even in B2B, really fast. You know, the, the salesperson, the engineering person, oh my God, the customer said this doesn't work. Uh, you know, I'll try to hack something together. Can you give me a demo by Tuesday? And in a large corporation, it was which Tuesday? I'm booked for the next two Tuesdays. I, I can get to it this month. But, but the cycle time's completely ruined. So, and, and by the way, the sales force is, is, is kind of slightly misdirected and the services people are saying, you know, I'll help you, but you know, my utilization number is kind of, kind of low this month and I'm, so I'm a little bit worried about helping you too much. Right? So you get all these messages back from the corporation of, you know, you, you're an irritant. You know, you, you just, I mean, you're my friend, but you're an irritant, right? So that's number, that, so you have, to, you have to be able to organize this thing, but you can't let it persist. At scale, this business has to melt back into the functional organization of the large corporation. So once you get to something close to horizon one scale where the business can survive, then there's no empire building. The sales goes back to the sales force, the engineering goes back to the engineering team, the support goes back to the support team, but during that, that order of magnitude race, it has to report to a single entrepreneurial GM who can move resources on a dime during that, during that period in order to adapt and grow fast. Fourth one, metrics. Tipping point metrics, crossing the chasm for B2B, four gears for B2C. And the last one, this is the one where, I, if I haven't been kicked out, 
Now, that's why I put it last, because this is almost always. So the compensation statement is, obviously you want to compensate the general manager of the Horizon 2 business unit with high variable compensation on getting to material size. Score, got it. Next, who's the ultimate sponsor of this initiative? Has to be the CEO. Okay, CEO, step up. Big part of your variable compensation is, did you get this Horizon 2 initiative to material size? Okay, that's number two. The painful one. Everybody who reports to the CEO, not the entrepreneurial GM, this is not in your business unit, all of your variable comp also is going to ride on the success of this one business unit that you did not fund and that you do not believe in and you don't even like the GM. <laughs> you, say, you, say, you, say, you say, that cannot be right. That, can, that violates every concept of compensation. I, have no, I can't do anything about this. It's all in his control or her control. What, this, is total, this, this, this is totally wrong. And the only reply I have is, well, first of all, we don't exactly have a very good existence proof for doing it the other way. But the other point is, are you telling me that if I told you that for the next three years, your variable compensation program is going to depend entirely on the performance of this business unit, that you can do nothing to improve the performance of this business unit? I mean, how dumb are you? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't believe that, OK? I believe that if you really bite on that bullet, that we'll take this thing through that horizon tooth gap in record speed because you're greedy individuals, right? And you will think of, wait, I can introduce him to this customer. I can get past this objection. I can tell that account guy, I'm sorry, this comes first. I can do a million things to make this thing happen. I can make it happen faster than venture. I can kick venture's ass if I have the entire executive team saying, this is how I'm going to get comped, particularly in a performance-driven culture. So the point about this exercise, and needless to say, the, the ink is not even dry on this slide. Um, it's a provocative, controversial pushing at it. But, it, but you know, it's, it's saying, well, it's been 15 years since Clay threw down the gauntlet. Somebody's got to pick it up. So let's go. OK, so that, so that was it. The, 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 the concept here was just the four things we're fighting against, the innovator's dilemma you know about. It's hard to take risk in big companies. Annual planning gets all the good resources for the, for the existing players. And the temporary financial markets, by the way, there is a J curve here, which is just brutal. And, the, and, and your stock price will get hammered. They'll get mad at you. But, but if that's what, another reason why you have to go fast. But here were the three, the last slide, the three things it takes. So it takes a focus on power, not performance. It's, the, the two are together. But the point about it is we've got to think much more in a committed way about power and not just keep on coming back to, well, now let's get back to the numbers, which is the performance part of the equation. The second piece, therefore, is it puts more pressure on leadership than management. It turns out management is the key to performance, and leadership is the key to power. And there, that's a yin-yang. It's a yin-yang. Sometimes you need more leadership. Sometimes you need more management. That's not like one's better than the other, but you need both. And then the third thing is it's got to be about the tipping point before the ROI. You, just, you have to do this if, if we're going to move the needle. So, that was, that was the last of that set. So first of all, thank you very much for letting me sort of...